please stand. my feet and a light on my path. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. I will delight in your statutes. Lord, your word is forever. It is firmly fixed in heaven. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. Happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all their heart. For every one of God's promises is yes in him. I will not forget your word. I put my hope in your word. I rise before dawn and cry out for help. I put my hope in your word. Let my cry reach you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. The entirety of your word is true, and all your righteous judgments endure forever. I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. Open my eyes so that I may see wonderful things in your law. But be but doers, doers of the word, word and, and not hearers only, only. Deceiving, deceiving yourselves. Yourself.
in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ. We're going to pray, and I'm going to give you something to pray about, but you can pray all you want to. So if you'll bow your heads, let us give thanks for our family that we have. Let us give thanks for what Christ has done for each one of us in our Christian growth. Let's give thanks for Christian friends. Let's give thanks for what Christ is doing in First Baptist Church. Let's give thanks for our leaders in our church, Brother Tom, our deacons, our teachers, our choir, our musical leaders, in our congregation. Let's pray for ourselves and what Christ has done for us as we worship with him daily. Lord, you've heard our prayers, our prayers of thanksgiving to you. May we always be thankful for Christ who died for our sins. And we'll pray these things, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome all of our First Baptist Church members, friends, and visitors. Uh, if you are a visitor, we do have a church uh, bus that if you need a ride to church, just call 359-4077. They'll be glad to come by and get you. Uh, this time, we're going to meet and greet, and then we'll read scripture. <laughs>
Today's scripture verse is found in the 17th chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 13, and that is on page 829 in your pew Bible. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. He was transformed in front of them, and his face shone like the sun. Even his clothes became as white as the light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And if you're reading from the King James Version, that will not be Elijah, it will be Elias, and that's Greek for, that, for Elijah. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you want, I will make three tabernacles, and some places in translation says tents. I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. Listen to him. When the disciples heard it, they fell face down and were terrified. Then Jesus came up, touched them and said, get up, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except him, Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone about the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So the disciples questioned him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first. Elijah is coming and will restore everything, he replied. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they didn't recognize him. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them about John the Baptist. God bless the reading of his word. Please stand as we sing.
Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> good morning, good morning. <coughs> good morning. I like that football shirt. <laughs> I want to talk to you guys this morning about something that I really hope none of you watch yet called the news. You may hear your parents talk about the news. And I, I kind of like the news sometimes, but sometimes I don't. You kind of have to listen to it and decide for yourself a lot of the things. But one thing that you can usually trust on the news is if something's happened and nobody at the news station was there when it happened, but they go out afterwards to report. And you may have seen this on TV somewhere. They'll stick a microphone in somebody's face and say, what did you see? Were you there? Did you see it? Those people are called eyewitnesses. They ha may have seen a car accident, or they may have seen somebody do a good deed even that's making the news. We need more of that. We need more good deeds to make the news. But those people are called eyewitnesses because they were there and they actually saw what happened. So they can... They can give you a really good report of what really did happen instead of just having to guess what happened. And did you know that we can all be eyewitnesses too? We can. Um, there, were, there were some eyewitnesses in the Bible. This book right here is just absolutely full of eyewitnesses. People who saw the things that Jesus Christ did. The miracles he worked and, and the, the love that he showed to everybody. And you know, we can all be eyewitnesses too. Let me read you a little something. Coach Eden's read a little something, and at the end, he talked about John the Baptist. And I'm glad he mentioned him, because that's the guy I'm going to talk about 
he came and he baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And in, in the book of John, we read, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was here before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. And then John gave his testimony, his eyewitness account. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. He saw it. John the Baptist was an eyewitness to the Spirit of God coming down on Jesus. So he went out and he told everybody from then on, everybody that he met, he told them about it. Now, when we let Jesus come into our hearts, he does amazing things for us. He does things we don't even realize. That's why it's so hard sometimes to pray and give thanks for all he's done because we don't have enough hours in the day to thank him for everything he's done. But we can go out and tell people what he's done. Every time we meet somebody, we should tell them all the things that Jesus has done for us in our life. And we can be eyewitnesses, and they'll believe it because they'll see it in us. Okay, can you guys go out and tell somebody today something that you've seen Jesus do? All right, let's say our prayers. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you today in praise and thanksgiving. I, I praise you, Lord, for each one of these precious little lives. and I pray that, that they will come to love you and have you in their hearts and, and take your teachings to heart, Lord. And, and go out and share their amazing eyewitness stories of what you've done in their lives with everyone they see. I ask you to watch over us all, keep us safe, Lord, and let our, our ears be open and our hearts be open to receive your message today. It's in your name I ask it. Amen. Please stand as we sing Sweet Our Prayer. <laughs> Let us continue our worship, giving our tithes and offerings from the abundance of what God has provided to us. Let us pray. Our Father, these gifts we have received, we return to you, asking that your name be glorified in what takes place with these funds. We ask that you strengthen your church, 
We ask that you extend your mission into the world around us. We ask that you bless people who know you and who have yet to come to know you. We pray, our Father, that Jesus himself will be very pleased with this offering we take today. In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said. I haven't mentioned Naphtali Rothrock before, but she has been ministering to us over the months, uh, filling in for Elise and uh, leading us in worship, and thank you, Naphtali. Will you open your Bibles with me this morning to Matthew chapter 17? Matthew chapter 17, and I just want you to have your Bible open. Um, to that passage of scripture so you can refer to uh, some things that are kind of highlighted. Uh, I've given you in the listening guide that you have in your hand a summary of Matthew chap uh, chapter 16 verses 16 through 28. I did not drill down on all of these points, but they're all in that passage of scripture that's foundational um, for understanding what the church is. The the picture of the church that, that Jesus is building that I'm finding in Scripture derives from this conversation that Jesus had with his disciples about his, his identity, who he is, about his plan to build his church, and about the cost of membership. And yeah, I use the word membership, not discipleship, uh, because I'm coming to believe that membership and discipleship are one and the same thing. And membership is the visible expression of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, and so we who are members of one another in the body of Christ that Jesus is building are, are, uh, are what the church is made of. Now, if you review the summary in, in Matthew 16, 16 through 27, um, you'll find that Jesus stationed his church on earth between heaven and hell. There's a tension in the the life of the church. He, we're definitely on earth. We're human beings. We're, we're a community of faith. Uh, we're different from any other uh, human organization that exists in the world uh, for a lot of reasons that we're going to explore in the days, days ahead. But uh, uh, Jesus put us in a tension between God's heavenly will and Satan's hellish desire for all of humanity. And we're literally in uh, uh, enemy territory as we go about the work of the, of the church. But we are his called out ones. That's what the word ecclesia means. That's the word that Jesus used when he said, I will build my church. 
We are the called out ones. We are recipients of his gospel. We have received the good news of Jesus Christ. We've taken it to heart. We've acted on it. We've begun to, uh, to believe it and to live it out. So because of that, we are redeemed by his sacrifice on the cross. We've been bought, paid for, bought with a price, and therefore we belong to God. We've been set free from sin in order to belong to him who loved us and gave himself for us. As the called out ones, we're reconciled to him who loved us. So we've come into a, a familial kind of relationship, family relationship with our loving God. Uh, we have been adopted into his family, the Bible tells us, and we are inhabited by his spirit. And uh, I, I realize as much as we sang about the presence of the Holy Spirit among us today, that for most of us, the reality of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church and in our personal lives remains somewhat mysterious and somewhat remote from our day-to-day -day living. We, we need to blow the dust off of that and, and work on it. Now, there was a young corporal who was feverishly ordering men around, trying to get them to help him fortify uh, position in preparation for the upcoming battle. This is during the Revolutionary War. Uh, the problem was that the others, the others being privates, I guess, uh, were not respecting him. They weren't doing what he was telling him. They were kind of talking back to him, and so he was having a hard time uh, getting the job done that he knew needed to take place because they were balking at following orders. Well, along came three horsemen in plain clothes who observed the fiasco that was taking place. They saw this, this little lowly corporal trying to get these other guys to do stuff that they were just laughing at him and, and resisting him doing, They're just doing half-heartedly. So the one who seemed to be the lead guy of the three horsemen um, dismounted and asked the corporal, what can I do to help? And the corporal told him, and so he began to pitch in and, and give the help. And before long, the others were kind of joining in and, and helping out because they felt the they began to feel the need to do the fortification that the, the corporal was trying to get them to do. But when the job was completed, the men mounted their horses and were about to ride off, but the corporal stopped them because he wanted to thank them for helping him get the job done. It was something that he apparently could not have done without their help at that time. The lead guy said to him, it was my honor to help, and if you ever need help again, just call on me. I'm George Washington, your commander-in-chief. That's the work of the Spirit in the life of the church. We Christians are more than we seem to the world around us because of the inhabitation of the Holy Spirit in our fellowship and in our personal lives. We can do things that we cannot do by ourselves. We can understand things that we cannot grasp with our little minds. We can perceive revelation and, and understand the leadership of the Lord. For God is spirit, and he's given us something of himself in the person of the Holy Spirit that we might understand him. We are called to an uncompromising holiness. That's why the Bible calls us saints. Saints means holy people, um, now, I've been around church for most of my life now, and, uh, and uh, I have the idea that most of us are anything but saints. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to you know, throw rocks at you because I know me, and uh, so I'm probably the least saintly of all the people in this place today, but that's only because I know myself better than I know you. Uh, probably if I knew you, I'd, I'd be able to say the same thing about you. <laughs> We're called to an uncompromising holiness, an uncommon love, and this is the amazing, one of the differences between us and, and the Rotary Club or any other social organization or parachurch organization is that Jesus said, when we love one another the way that he loves us, we prove to the world around us that we're his disciples. Love should flow freely in the congregation, in the membership of the church, the this kind of love should be on exhibit in every gathering that we have, uh, that we come together for. We're called to an uncommon love, an unconventional unity. I, I love this about the church. When we all get to heaven, who's going to be there? 
You'll be there. That's good. That's right. But you're, you're kind of homogenous, sort of vanilla, if you catch my drift. We're, we're a bunch of middle-class white people who have gathered together in this particular church, and we're together largely because we're like each other. You know? But when we get to heaven, it ain't going to be just us, is it? Every tribe, every race, every nation, every tongue, every color, those who are pretty and those who are not will be in heaven. And God would be most glorified on earth if his people gathered together in multicultural, multi-ethnic, multicolored congregations, that would be more like heaven. Amen? So the, the thing that brings us together is not our commonality. If we build on our commonality, we miss the greatness of God calling his people from every corner of the earth to come together as his people. And why could it not happen right here, today, in our time? Amen? It's an unconventional unity that brings us together. We're called to an unconquerable victory. Oh yeah, the church is caught between heaven and hell. We have spiritual struggles. Every Christian I know that I've ever had an opportunity to talk about uh, to talk with about problems going on in their lives. Talk about not just problems that are common to us all, but spiritual problems that assault their lives, spiritual challenges that they're facing day by day against real spiritual foes. Their biggest problems are not against other people, but against spiritual forces of evil that are uh, alive and well and working in our world. It's this dynamic of being in the world that is under the dominion of, of Satan, we're part of captured territory. Now, we're ambassadors. We're ambassadors. Now, you know what an embassy in a foreign country is, don't you? No. An embassy in a foreign country is a, a government will get a little piece of property, and in that, that little compound that they call their embassy, they will represent the concerns of their nation in a foreign land, in another place. And, and so to speak, that little territory, that embassy territory, is really a part of their nation. The United States Embassy in Iraq is, uh, uh, they closed it, I think, didn't they? But some other place in the world, that's United States territory. For a citizen to be there, you can, you can be safe. Well, we're ambassadors. We're an embassy located in enemy territory. We're serving the interests in occupied enemy territory for the one that bought us for himself. We're searching for souls to reconcile to God. And we're sending his workers into his harvest to do his bidding for his glory. Now, the story that we, we looked at this morning, the story of the transfiguration, I think it's an unfortunate break, chapter break here. Um, the reason I I'm, I'm, I'm say that is because if you look at verse 28 in chapter 16, Jesus told the disciples, truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then this, this next statement, this next story about the transformation and transfiguration of Jesus occurs. And that paragraph break sort of sets it off in our minds as if it was something distinct and something out of the ordinary. But it, it's continuous with the flow of the conversation. It happened, of course, it was six days later, and that's, it's very, very interesting, uh, some of the things that come together, because it testifies to or anticipates the, the resurrection and glorification of Jesus. That's, that's what the, this story is all about. For those disciples, it was something out ahead of him. For us, the resurrection is a past event, a historical event that, uh, that we can count on. 
But the glorification of Jesus is yet to happen in a way that, uh, uh, that we will all long to see. This uh, story of the transfiguration recalls some past events that have already occurred. Those who listened to Jesus perhaps had heard the stories in Exodus 24 and Exodus 34 where Moses goes up on the mountain with a couple of guys. God has called him to go up on the mountain. And uh, as he goes up onto the mountain, the cloud descends on the, on the top of the mountain and, and there's, there's flame and fire and rumbling and, and all of that. It's a very tumultuous kind of event. And then God calls Moses into the cloud and that's kind of an Old Testament picture of what happened here. And um, when, when Jesus was transfigured before them, his, his, his whole body, his whole countenance, his, his, even his clothing began to glow with a radiance that defies our imagination. We just read about it taking place, and it's an ama amazing kind of a thing. Same sort of thing happened when Moses came down from the mountain. In Exodus 34, um, his face glowed, and it was frightening to the people as he came down from the mountain to tell the people what God had spoken to them. His face shining as it was, he felt the need to cover it with a veil. So this is stuff that has happened before, but now it's the disciples and it's the new event and Jesus is superseding even Moses and Elijah. He's now the big guy. He's now the most outstanding personality on the mountain. So this recalls those events and combines for us some encouragements that come by testimonies of eyewitnesses, the Holy Scriptures, and the Holy Spirit. Listen to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Peter, for we did not follow cleverly contrived myths when we made, all right, come on, <laughs> when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, this is my beloved son. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard his voice when it came from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter's just talking about something that he remembered from happening long ago. And he's just telling us, I was there. I saw it. I experienced it. I knew what it was all about. I'm, I'm telling you what I have to say to you is important because I was there when it occurred. Verse 19 in, in uh, 1 Peter says, We also have the prophetic word strongly confirmed, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We have the prophetic word made more sure. It's strongly confirmed. That's the language that is used in this translation that I, that I have here. The ancient text has this stamp of authority on it now because of what happened with Jesus on that mountain and what those disciples experienced. You know, that, that kind of a commanding thing. And Peter is saying, you know, it's not unheard of. This is in the Bible. It's all there. And this confirms in a powerful way what the scriptures have told us about the coming Messiah and about the church that he will build. Verse 20, above all, you know this, no prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You catch the, the, the encouragement that comes from the word of an eyewitness and from the the. The, the scriptures themselves, and that now from the Holy Spirit. And I love this, that, that, uh, this picture that Peter paints for us about the prophecy of Scripture or about what we're doing now, this preaching thing that we're doing. The word picture is that of if you're setting sail. You know, there comes a time, I don't know anything about this really, 
personally. I've just seen it happen, you know. Uh, but you unfurl the sail and you pull it up and the wind catches it. And, and the power of the wind begins to carry the ship. That's, that's the picture that Peter's using. He says, only it is the Spirit of God that fills the sail. It's the Spirit of God that gives the, the message, the prophecy that needs to be spoken. And it is the Spirit of God, by the way, that enables us to get the message and to apply it to our lives. So we have the encouragement of eyewitnesses, of Scripture, and of the Holy Spirit in this event. Now, this is his church, and we are members. Members of his body and members of one another. Now, we faithful members of his church will one day share his glory in the presence of God. That's another thing that this, this transfiguration moment does for us. One day, we'll be with Jesus when he is fully glorified. We, too, will be glorified with him. There are three out realities, I think, of that, that set the church apart from the world. The first of those is this, the gospel. The gospel that Christ died for our sins. That God has wide open arms ready to receive us, to welcome us on the basis of his forgiveness in our lives. We come into a right relationship with God through this forgiveness. Conversion is not the same as knowing what the gospel is. Conversion occurs both by the work of the Holy Spirit giving us life raising us up and, and showing us the meaning of the gospel, but it is also our response, our spirit-inspired response to apply the gospel to our life and, and experience. So there's a difference between the gospel. It's one thing to understand the gospel, but another thing to be converted through the work of the spirit to the gospel. And membership, well, membership, I think, is something more than just joining more than making a decision, more than putting your name on the dotted line and saying, I want to be a part of that fellowship. Membership, I think, truly demonstrates conversion and makes the gospel visible to our neighbors. There's more to it than just joining a church. We faithful members of his church will know the Father's pleasure in us, even as we find our greatest pleasure in here. In him. Listen to Psalm 73, verses 25 through 28. Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those far from you will certainly perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you, but as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord. God, my refuge, so I can tell all about you, what you do. We faithful members of his church long to hear him say to his righteous ones, his good and faithful servants, as Matthew 25 calls them, come you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Don't you want that commendation for God, from God? for the life that you've lived in obedience to the truth of the gospel? Yes, you do. Even as he will say to the pretenders, the mere professors of faith, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. If you're looking at Matthew 25, verses 34 and 41, those are chilling, chilling verses. Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom, but only those who do the will of my Father. And he illustrated what he meant by that, but there's an element of obedience that comes to be being a part of the church that Jesus is building. 
In John's revelation, there are two doors. I found this very, very interesting. The one door is the closed door, the door of the church that is closed to Jesus. If you read Revelation 3, verses 20 through 22, you hear the familiar words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. Now, you've got to remember, these are, this is one of the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. This was not written to an individual. So the door that we're being talk, that's being talked about here is not the door of an individual heart as much as it is the door of the church that has been closed to Jesus. That has been closed to Jesus by the work of the church to become something other than what the church has, was intended to be. So Jesus would say, I have this problem with your fellowship. If you repent, I will restore you. If you do not, you will pay an awful price. So that's the import of those, those words. Verse 21 says, To the one who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. I take that to mean anybody who senses the door is closed to Jesus can be the one to open it for him to come into the church back into the church to reclaim what is rightfully his. Stunning kind of interpretation, don't you agree? Stunning kind of application of Jesus' words themselves. I assure you the situation is as I have described it. For all of those churches in Asia Minor and for the churches that exist in our world today, that's our invitation to Jesus. Come in. Come fellowship with us. Come restore us. Come make us what you want us to be. That's our invitation to Jesus. But there's another door, and it's the open door in heaven. Look at Revelation 4, verse 1, the very next verse. After this I looked, and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I heard speaking to me, like a trumpet said, come up here, and I will show you what, you must, what must take place after this. Immediately, I was in the Spirit, and there was a throne in heaven, and someone was seated on it. That's Jesus' in invitation to us to come up to where he is. It's, it's a kind of an invitation to step up or to step out, to move beyond where you are, to move beyond what's comfortable, traditional, acceptable, pleasant. Come up here is Jesus' invitation to us all to become the church that he planned, that he purposed to build. I think we need to quit right here. So will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Our Father, we hear your word. We may not fully get it, but what we do understand, we ask that you help us to be faithful to act on it. We long to make the gospel visible in our world as your church, as members of your body. We pray, our Father, that you will continue moving among us and reaching out beyond us to include in your church those whom you save. And in these quiet moments of reflection that will follow, we ask that you touch hearts to move us, draw us closer to you. And we give you thanks and praise in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and for his sake.